this one is a, a, basically a quick introduction to metabolomics. It's not going to be really quick. I guess it'll be about a, an hour and 20 minutes. Um, what we do with these uh, lectures or labs is we always define some um, learning objectives. Um, and hopefully at the end of the lecture, at the end of the lab, uh, you'll have actually achieved those objectives. One of the things, at least for this, is we'll be looking at, at the size of the metabolome. Um, this is something that's uh, still a, a topic of plenty of discussion, and, and people who were around a long time ago probably also were part of the discussions about the size of the genome, uh, which was debated for, for many, many years. Um, still not fully resolved, at least for the human genome, but in the case of metabolomes, it's, it's changing every day, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about some of the applications of metabolomics. You will see certainly many more applications, and many of you have already described some of the other applications that you are using in your own work. We're going to dive into uh, the principles of liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, MS, and NMR, and it's going to be a 30,000 foot view of it. Um, but certainly, if you'd like, we can go into it in more detail if you have questions. And then we're going to distinguish between targeted and untargeted metabolomics because there's sort of a fundamental difference between the two. Um, a lot of our work uh, will be more towards targeted, but we'll also give untargeted metabolomics a bit of a try here uh, later on. A schedule Anne has already given you, and uh, you have that in your notes, and um, hopefully uh, we'll stick reasonably close to the time. We might be a little slow off the start here. Um, so let's start with uh, a slide I often begin with in, in discussions on metabolomics. Um, so I use this pyramid picture here, and, and at the base of the pyramid is the genome, and what we study, or how we study the genome, is using genomics and next-gen sequencing and RNA-seq and, and transcriptomics, and, and as we progress up the pyramid, genes code for proteins, and the study of proteins is proteomics, and there's at least two or three of you who are also specialists in proteomics. At the top of the pyramid, being the most important, uh, is metabolomics, <laughs> um, but it's really to indicate that, that things sort of flow up because um, subtle small changes in the genome are amplified. Uh, particularly up to the metabolome, and this makes the metabolome uh, a particularly sensitive indicator of what's going on in terms of physiology. Francis? So the size of the top mean that it's the least understood? <laughs> no, that's probably true. Um, it used to be that we'd draw the same pyramid to say the number of things we knew, because we could go like 20, 23,000 genes, and then the number of proteins that are involved actually enzymatically is about five or 6,000, and then the number of metabolites that we knew about 10 years ago was about 2,500. Uh, now the pyramid's in, inverted. Um, estimates now there's up to 2 million metabolites in the human body. And of course, there's all kinds of alternate splice uh, variants in proteome, so it's much larger than the genome. So uh, in terms of size, it's inverted. In terms of our knowledge, um, yeah, probably. Um, there is a lot. And so this is, it's, a, it's a nice time to be involved in metabolomics, I think. Uh, it's, it's a big um, sandbox. I don't know how much discussion you want. Sure. <laughs> Once they start being laid, then we'll start having the discussion. But we're one of the things that strikes me, just from our limited work with metabolomics, is uh, the metabolic pathway. We're talking about known versus unknown. The metabolic pathways seem very well characterized relative to, say, genetic. Yeah. Yeah. So, like what genes do seem much fuzzier. That's true. Uh, I think. I mean, no. It's. I think in terms of pathways, we know um, the basic metabolism very well, uh, and that's been known probably since the '60s. Um, the. Um, I think what what we'll try and learn about, or I'll try and emphasize a lot, is that um, metabolomics isn't just about catabolism and anabolism. Uh, metabolites actually play a huge role in signaling, 
uh, and in gene uh, activation, deactivation. They also play really important roles at a physiological level in terms of events uh, in the body. And those pathways aren't in KEG. Uh, they aren't anywhere. Uh, some of them are in textbooks. And in that regard, uh, it's a very poorly studied part of metabolomics. And it's probably 99% of the functions of metabolites are in these other areas uh, that, that we just don't have uh, the pathways for. And it's unfortunate, I think, that because, I mean, we tend to pluck the low-hanging fruit, and because the pathways in KEG and other places are easy to find, we tend to interpret metabolomic data purely from catabolism and anabolism. And some of it's true, but I, th I think we're, we're starting to realize that we're missing a huge amount um, by not including or encompassing those, those other elements of homeostasis, pathway regulation, everything else. So we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more, but I think this is another component here. I've got two arrows showing, which also go up in, in terms of the, um, the effect um, that both environment and physiology have on, on the <coughs> genome and the proteome and the metabolome. Many of you have just had breakfast. Um, that is changing your metabolome. Hopefully it's not changing your genome. Uh, <laughs> if it is, I think we'd all be pretty pretty much zombie mutants, I think. But the point being is that the metabolome is at that interface uh, between the genome and environment. And the mix between genome and environment is, is, is the phenotype. So in that regard, the metabolome is your best indicator of the phenotype. There's also something that we tend to, to forget, those of you involved in, in um, biochemistry and even cell biology is that we tend to think of, of organisms as, as single cells. Human is just one very large single cell. A and we're not. We actually have um, dozens of different organs that have fundamentally different metabolomes um, that uh, interact with each other. And much of the organ systems in our body were, were evolved to deal with and to produce different types of metabolomes. So Physiology, which is something we tend to neglect or forget in the biochemical world, is, is something that the metabolome is, is very much uh, sensitive to and, and reflects uh, what's going on in, in terms of physiology. We'll also talk about, about that a bit more. Um, again, this is a, almost a throwaway slide because I'm sure all of you know about genomics and, and metabolomics, but the, the genesis of the metabolomic name um, which, as I said, started with the word metabonomics and kenomics and chemical genomics, is really just trying to capture the excitement from especially the 90s of genomics and proteomics. Um, so the idea of using high-throughput technologies, uh, the idea of using computers um, to try and characterize as much as you can, as quickly as you can. And of course, the focus in metabolomics is small molecules, whereas in genomics, it's on genes. There's also been evol evolving definitions of what are metabolites. <clears throat> the one that we've used um, is essentially organic molecules, although you can probably include inorganic salts now. But the typical thing is a molecular weight less than 1,500 Daltons. Uh, some people use the cutoff of 1,000, some will use 2,000, but we're sticking with the middle, and it, it captures most things uh, that people would consider metabolites. So it can include short peptides, and it can include short oligonucleotides. That's okay. But what we mostly think about in terms of metabolites are the other kinds of small molecules, so the sugars and the organic acids and amino acids and steroids and lipids. But the other part to remember is that the metabolome of many organisms also consists of, of what organisms eat we eat other metabolomes. And so our bodies are composed of those metabolomes. So there are plant metabolomes in our bodies. There are microbial metabolomes in our bodies. But there are also xenobiotics. There are thousands of synthetic molecules that are added to the yogurt you've been eating or the bread you've been eating. We touch and inhale things that go through our skin or lungs. That includes uh, various pollutants. Um, 
variety of, of toxic compounds uh, that are found in the water and just about anywhere else. Um, drugs, drug metabolites, whether they're prescription or over-the-counter or supplements, those are also part of the metabolome. And obviously they're part of ours, but they're also part of many other animals and plants and microbes. So in terms of humans, we'll look at both you know, human products, synthetic as well as endogenous, microbial products, same with plants. The concentration limits are variable, it depends on your instruments, but as a cutoff we'll say anything greater than picomolar, which is typically below the sensitivity of most instruments. So again, the metabolome has, the definition has evolved, so essentially people used to consider only the endogenous things, only the things that are bodies or where enzyme pathways directed, but we now realize that you know one of the largest organs in our body is the is the microbiome. Uh, we also realize that there's a huge number of exogenous compounds that accumulate um, or uh, transiently exist in our bodies. There's also a large collection of what we'll call theoretical molecules, where there is essentially no authentic standard that you can buy or synthesize, but we know the compound actually has to exist because of either some work done in the 50s or 60s where they did actually isolate it briefly, or where they know the intermediate has to exist based on chemistry. So that means that in some regards the metabolome evolves because it's, it depends on both the technology that we use to detect things, uh, and as technology improves, the metabolome ex expands, but also on our definitions. So people will distinguish between endogenous and exogenous metabolites. The fact that it's dependent on technology, dependent on some definitions which are still evolving, dependent on different tissues and organisms, it means the metabolome size is always going to be ill-defined. So we'll never have an answer, an absolute answer like we will have or already have for the size of the genome of, say, microbes, or E. coli, or C. elegans, and maybe in a couple of years we'll have a firm number for, for the human genome. In terms of the size of metabolomes and metabolites, um, right now we figure there's about 60,000 molecules that we can definitely say are in humans and other mammals. Um, as I say, the, the probable number, um, based on a variety of calculations, it, it could be up, upwards of 2 million. But there, these are 60,000 that appear in the literature. Microbes is a, a big debate about how, <coughs> how diverse the microbial community is. Um, I've chosen a number of 100,000 being slightly larger and more complex uh, or in terms of chemistry than, than, than humans. Um, my own gut feeling actually is that microbial metabolome is actually smaller. On the other hand, the plant metabolome uh, is the most complicated. And the reason why the plant metabolome is so much larger and more complicated is because plants can't run away from threats. So they've evolved a, a chemical warfare approach, and they've created a huge, vast number of, of um, what we'll call secondary metabolites that is uh, growing all the time. And so from a chemist's point of view, or natural products chemist's uh, point of view, uh, plants are a real gold mine. Uh, just an amazing diversity, an amazing source also for drug, uh, uh, drug leads and drug-inspired compounds. Now, I'm not including uh, some of the other things that are, you know, between plants and microbes. So these are might be small micro, uh, not microorganisms, but multicellular um, flagellates and, and other kinds of primitive organisms, some of which also probably have incredible diversity in terms of their chemical repertoire. Um, so, ironically, uh, we tend to think of mammals as being, you know, most complicated and sophisticated, but chemically they're the least. This is sort of a, an enumeration of, of what we know about human metabolomes and human metabolites. Um, there's about 20,000 endogenous metabolites that we've annotated in, in the human metabolome database. So these are things that your enzymes are designed to produce, transport, transform. Um, 
ones that we can sort of track to, to pathways um, that are, are, are reasonably well known. Um, there are many other microbial metabolites, and then of course there are all the other exogenous metabolomes. So there are drugs. Uh, there are huge numbers of food metabolites or food compounds uh, in your body. So these include many plants and 80 to 90 percent of your caloric intake um, actually comes from plants and plant derivatives. Drugs get broken down into drug metabolites and then there are a variety of, of uh, I guess we'll call them pollutants, environmental chemicals, um, toxins. What I've indicated here is the range in concentrations that you'll see. So the most concentrated or abundant metabolite um, in your body is urea. Uh, it can get up to concentrations of several hundred millimolar. Um, and then you can find metabolites all the way down to picomolar, femtomolar levels. Um, so there's a broader range in terms of concentrations for endogenous metabolites, um, many, many orders of magnitude. Drugs are less abundant, and they are roughly at the same level that you'll find for foods and food additives, and drug metabolites at lower levels, and then you hope, if you're healthy, that the toxins are, are even much, much lower levels. Um, there are a number of databases that we've established over the years that try and capture this information. So the human metabolome database is one, drug bank is another, the food database or food DB is another and the toxic exposome, or T3DB, is another one. We'll talk more about these later on, but these are examples of resources that, that help you identify but also understand um, the roles of these chemicals. And they're not just intended to be only for humans. The same metabolites are found in mice and rats and cows. Um, and many of these things are also found in plants and microbes. In fact, the human metabolome includes hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of microbial metabolites already. Now, I think it's also important to remember that there's what we know, and then there's what we don't know. And I've mentioned this term, theoretical human metabolites. And these are things that largely represent the... the peaks or features you'll see in LCMS studies particularly, uh, of which there are often tens of thousands of unidentified uh, features. And we know from variations in lipid structure and fatty acid structure that it's possible to easily generate several hundred thousand lipids, uh, which are not in the databases. We know through biotransformation studies that it's easily possible to generate tens of thousands of drug metabolites. The transformations that go on in food additives, which are treated as xenobiotics, just like drugs, also hundreds of thousands. And then even within our own metabolome, the endogenous molecules, the uh, cytochrome P450s, uh, the glucuronidase, all these enzymes that are used for phase one and phase two metabolism also will pick on these molecules and do some interesting chemistry on them. So these are secondary endogenous metabolites. So I've put some almost random numbers beside them, but as I say, I think that the feeling now is it's perhaps up to two million theoretical compounds that would exist in your bodies, probably at very, very low concentrations, sort of the picomolar, nanomolar levels, uh, but some of which we see um, as these unknown features in, in LCMS. So why is metabolomics important? Um, most of you are here because you think metabolomics is important. Um, but I, I think um, here's some numbers that might help also justify um, why you're here. Interestingly, even today, more than 95% of the common diagnostic assays uh, look for small molecules. Um, medicine revolves around the tests of small molecules. So maybe the headline grabbing stories are about the new gene test or a new protein test, but the default is still to look to metabolites. And the reason is, is because we can absolutely quantify metabolites. It's still very hard to do absolute quantitation for proteins, and it's still very hard to do absolute quantitation for gene transcripts. Um, so wherever you can get an absolute number, uh, that makes for a very powerful uh, clinical medical test. 
Uh, just under 90% of all known drugs are small molecules. So again, even though the headlines are mostly about new antibody drugs, for every antibody drug that makes it to the market, there's still another 9 or 10 small molecules that are also making it to the market. So the drug industry still depends fundamentally on small molecules. Most of the inspiration for drugs comes from natural products, from small molecules. Likewise, even in the realm of genetics, almost a third of identified genetic disorders are also metabolic diseases. And then, as, a, as I think we talked about before, the small molecules play a, a key role not just in general catabolism and, ab and anabolism, but they are really the, the cofactors and signaling molecules for, for most of the proteins. They play a vital role that's really underappreciated, I think, both within the metabolomics community but everywhere else. I have just one question. Uh, just um, in terms of diagnostics, with proteomics, there's so much false positives and difficulty in doing samples lab to lab or even machine to instrument to instrument. Is this, are they developing diagnostics that will be much more reproducible from a metabolomic standpoint? Yeah, so you with... Know, as, as the gold standard, I mean, because it always seems like proteomics next year is the big year, next year is a big year, but it, does, it doesn't come. I mean, <laughs> I'm in plant proteomics, not human, but that's my general yeah. impression. No, it, it's... The, the, the difficulty was that proteomics evolved initially as an identification uh, field um, rather than quantification. The origins of metabolomics come from purely analytical chemistry, and analytical chemists have always been obsessed about quantitation. And, and ironically, um, both with transcriptomics, RNA-seq and, and proteomics, the, the, the focus is let's just identify and we're not worried about really how much is there or let's worry about the relative quantitation. So in metabolomics we have isotopic standards and we can use SRM, MRM, whatever to try and, and actually get absolute values. And in fact it is possible and it's routinely possible now to get highly reproducible uh, precise quantitative numbers. That means what you measure here is the same as what you measure in Botswana or Mongolia. And those same numbers can be transferred across. That's the ideal uh, clinical test. So proteomics has just got that. It just figured that out about three or four years ago. And so there's a big push in proteomics to do quantitative work. It means synthesizing all kinds of C13 labeled peptides and having libraries and spending tens of thousands of dollars to get those. But those exist now and people are doing some pretty good quantitative proteomics work, and that's completely changing the field. There are now pretty reliable biomarkers that, that you can measure in, in proteomics. So I think we're going to see a resurgence in terms of biomarkers, um, but the preference, at least for proteomics, is that as soon as you've got a protein test, convert it to an ELISA. It's cheaper. Um, with metabolomics, because you can use a lot of these things on triple quads, and triple quads are everywhere, every clinical testing lab in the world has one, um, it's cheap to do it. And, and so it's very easy to convert um, something that you've got in the lab to a, a, a clinical test. Okay, um, so this just emphasizes this point about the canaries in the coal mine metabolites are the canaries of the genome. And this is this amplification effect that I talked about with the pyramid. Um, so this is again another reason why metabolomics is important. Uh, it's why it's used in clinical chemistry. It's why it's used in, in phenotyping, in, in, in plants, and microbes, and, and in mammals. There's a temporal issue with metabolomics as well. I talked about you know, because what you're eating is changing your metabolome. Um, in this case, this person's metabolome is, is widely varying, just because they're eating so quickly, I think. But it's, it's a case that, that many metabolites, all of these things that are both foods and food products and digestion that's going on, and it happens in seconds. The moment the food touches your uh, tongue, basically, salivary enzymes are metabolizing it, some of it's being absorbed very quickly. 
and it's going through the entire body. What you're breathing is also changing uh, your metabolism. You know, hold your breath for 20 seconds and your metabolism changes. Hold your breath for 10 minutes, well, you're dead, but your metabolism has changed uh, in that 10 minutes. If we sequenced you, we couldn't tell you that you're dead. If we looked at your proteome, we probably couldn't tell you that you're dead. So the proteome changes slower. And in the case of eating food, it's, it's going to be a few enzymes, insulin, glucagon, a couple other proteins will go up or down slowly. Their effects are slower, longer term. And then, as I said, the genome is not supposed to change. It's supposed to be incredibly stable. If it wasn't, uh, we'd all be sort of these walking mutants. So this is this temporal sensitivity. So some think that's great. Um, others think that is a real problem. And, and I think it, you can look at it both ways correctly that way. As we talked about, uh, metabolism, at least as it relates to catabolism and anabolism, is pretty well understood. We have more detailed pathways for metabolism than we have for gene signaling and protein signaling. What we don't have, though, is we don't have the pathways for metabolite signaling. And that's something that I think is, is a real, real issue. If you do metabolomics, I think you'll find that because it's sort of at that top of the pyramid or the last part of the pipeline, um, people will come to you and say, you know, how do I interpret my metabolomic data? You're going to have to explain it both in terms of the proteome and the genome. Um, so that way, metabolomics is uniquely connected. Many people doing genomics will just view it as a silo on its own. It doesn't have to think about proteins and metabolites. Many people doing proteomics also treat it almost as a silo on its own. But because metabolomics is one of the last emerging omics to, to appear, but also because it's so close to the phenotype, it ends up having to be much more connected to the other omics technologies and fields. This connection is also mirrored in the fact that small molecules are used to make up the DNA and the RNA. Small molecules are used to make up the proteins. Small molecules are used to make up the lipids, which give the cells their shape and structure. Obviously, small molecules are the energy source, the fuel for the body, the cofactors for signaling. And you can kind of turn the whole field of biology a little bit on its head in the thinking that really, and I think it's quite justified, the genome and the proteome really evolved to catalyze chemistry. Um, so that is the essence of, of living systems. We're just trying to perform chemistry in confined spaces, i.e. cells, and we're trying to do it faster. So you need proteins. To make the proteins, you need genes. But this is this is how life evolved was just to make chemistry happen faster. So the other part I think that we're going to see and talk about is this how metabolomics, because it's so connected to the other omics, really helps enable the concept of systems biology, this integration of genome, proteome, metagenome, metabolome. So rather than seeing these things as layers, metabolomics through bioinformatics tries to merge all of these things together. And we'll see that tomorrow when we talk a little bit more about metaboanalyst and other tools. <clears throat> Lots of applications. You guys have already mentioned many of the other things you're doing. Uh, these are just some more examples, some of which you're already doing. But there's applications in, in clinical work, in, in, in pharmaceutical work, in toxicological, environmental studies, food and beverage monitoring and testing, uh, petrochemical analysis, water quality assessments. The, the list just keeps on growing. So I'm going to dive into the methods associated with metabolomics. Um, again, this is sort of a 30,000 foot overview. Uh, and it's partly to bring some people up to speed. Some of you will probably start drifting off to sleep because you, you know a lot of these things already. But some of you don't. And I think, as I said, it's a diverse group and, and we feel we usually have to do this to keep everyone um, sort of on par. Does anyone have any questions about this first little bit, that what I've mentioned, talked about? Anyways, feel free to, to interrupt and, and chat uh, if you'd like. So in terms of workflow, 
Uh, metabolomics works on many different s substrates and, and, and sample types. So there's some people doing plant metabolomics, some doing bovine metabolomics, some people doing microbial, a lot of you doing human. If the sample is solid, we mush it up, we extract it. If we can get something that is already fluidized, that's our preference. So for plants, we prefer sap or, or, or juices. For humans, we prefer blood or, 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 or urine. Um, the reason is that most analytical instruments are designed for working with fluids, because this is what chemists tend to work with. Obviously, there's now work on tissue metabolomics, and, and uh, that's evolving. And, and so again, we, we can avoid the extraction procedure and do some imaging. But even with tissues, as a rule, we just mush it up. Um, there's the chemical analysis step, um, which is LCGC, MS, NMR, IR, a whole bunch of different tools. Most of those steps are pretty routine. They've been around for decades. The fundamental revolution in metabolomics was going to the last step. It was taking all that analytical stuff and translating it into compounds, concentrations, and doing it with, in many cases, a very complex mixture. So that's what we're going to talk about most of today, really. So it's the software and databases that have emerged over the last 10 years that have enabled metabolomics. It's not the extraction techniques. It's not the mass spec or NMR. Those have been around and largely f capable of doing these things for, for actually many decades. And you look at the extraction techniques, and many of them date from the 40s and 50s. Yes? So um, I've received <laughs> criticism from other collaborators saying that when you are, for example, when you're studying uh, human physiology, you're studying, what we're studying is uh, plasma, for example. And that's essentially exchanging with the cells all the time. So when you're mushing up everything, when you're uh, for an extraction, you're essentially mixing all the effects of all the different types of tissues, and different types of cells, both intracellular and extracellular. And they're saying, how can you be sure what you're seeing is an effect of within the cell? Or yeah, that's, that's a good point. So I guess I, sh I should be repeating these questions, right? Because <laughs> so the question is, yeah, are we losing information by, by extraction? Uh, are we losing cellular information? And yes, we are. Um, the um, ideally we'd love to be able to do um, single cell metabolomics because we are able to do single cell sequencing single cell transcriptomics but i think the other point to remind people is that that the metabolomics is designed and the metabolism uh, and metabolites are, are really designed also to work at a physiological level so reducing every individual to a whole bunch of trillions of cells actually complicates the process rather than simplifies or really helps the process. So we see, and there are many hundreds of studies where they can look at plasma and see um, significant effects in the metabolome for perturbations that are localized to just a single organ or a small number of cells in the tissue. Cancer is often the best example, um, but tumors, you know, centimeter to across can have very significant changes in you know over four or five liters of plasma um, it persists what's often not appreciated is that many of those perturbations are concentrated in the urine so the urine is the repository for all things the body doesn't want and so by concentrating that um, you actually see an amplification now it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what's going on, but because we know a fair bit about catabolism, metabolism, some of the sources for these molecules can be isolated or, or localized or understood. But yeah, if you want a, you know, a detailed tissue-specific uh, understanding, this is, I think, the appeal for, for metabolite imaging. Uh, and you can see fascinating differences between different tissues, even within regions within a cell polarization that happens and I think um, so there's there's different things that, that people will expect or ask but I think from the perspective of people who have been doing genomics single cell proteomics 
uh, they'll always complain that you know metabolomics just can't can't cut it. You can't do single cell. But I think you always have to counter that. And metabolomics is about physiology. Okay, um, we're going to talk a little bit about more about the coverage. Um, again, we're using this pyramid. I like the concept partly because we can always show these numbers. Um, in terms of what we can routinely measure, obviously in a human or mammalian genomes, it's about 20, 22,000 genes. Proteomics, routinely between five and 10,000 proteins now. It's, it's climbing, it's getting better. The average metabolomic study will identify less than 200 chemicals. So experimentally, uh, metabolomics is lagging way, way behind genomics and proteomics. Now, in metabolomic studies, people can claim that they see 10,000 or even 20,000 features, but the actual number of identified compounds is, is tiny. So this is a, a, a fundamental weakness of metabolomics, and, and figuring out ways of, of improving or increasing that number, I think, is the major goal over the next few years in, in metabolomics research. One of the reasons why it's so hard and why we cover so few compounds or components in metabolomics is because of the diversity. So in DNA, we just have to worry about the chemistry of four bases. In proteomics, we just have to worry about the chemistry of 20 pro amino acids. The number of chemical classes in very large terms is something on the order of four or 5,000. The number of chemicals is hundreds of thousands to millions. Each of them requires either a separate purification protocol or separate isolation or deterrent characterization. So the, the fact that you're having to deal with so many different chemicals is the fundamental reason why metabolomics is more difficult than proteomics and genomics. And so if you're, you know, genomic and proteomic colleagues are pointing fingers and laughing at you, um, just tell them you're, you're dealing with a much more complicated problem. So it also means that to do metabolomics, you can't get away with just a high -se DNA sequencer or an Affymetrix gene chip or uh, a single MALDI uh, mass spec for, for proteomics. You have to use a lot of different tools. Uh, chromatography, HPLC, UPLC, capillary electrophoresis, general chromatography, SP, and then a whole bunch of different types of mass spectrometers. Uh, some at low resolution, some at high. NMR complements GC, another critical one. People are using FTIR. Solving the structures of some of these things actually requires crystallography. Um, so the technologies required by metabolomics are much broader because of the chemical complexity that you, you deal with. So it makes it a more challenging field overall. So I'm going to talk about some of these technologies. Um, we'll start off with chromatography, um, separation. So we're looking at uh, separating things on a, from a mixture, and we're using both a mobile phase and a stationary phase. Um, chromatography comes from the word of separating by color, uh, and it was uh, essentially how uh, the very first chromatographic studies were done, where they sort of separate food dyes or other equivalents. Um, there are many types of chromatography. Um, TLC, thin layer chromatography, is something that some of you, maybe many of you have done. Most people probably run columns, but you can run it both in liquid or gas, so that mobile phase can be a gas uh, phase. There's certain types of affinity and ion exchange and science exclusion, primarily more for larger molecules. In the case of small molecules, we'll use reverse phase, normal phase, um, hillock. Sometimes we'll just let things pass through with gravity. Other cases, we'll use higher pressure. And in the case of higher pressure, we'll use HPLC, high pressure, or ultra high pressure. Uh, or performance, uh, liquid chromatography. So this has been fundamental to the advances in small molecule research for the last um, three or four decades. Um, higher pressures are used. Um, instead of 20 PSI, sort of the common um, 
atmospheric pressure, it's 30 times greater. We use very small particles. It's a very sensitive technique if you've got a good um, detector, uh, and you can do separations of all kinds of different small molecules. So reverse phase, we typically separate non-polar molecules, hydrophobic molecules. In that case, you use a non-polar C8, C18 um, stationary phase, and then you usually use some kind of polar solvent, like uh, methanol, water, or acetonitrile. Normal phase, uh, which is actually the first modality for HPLC, hardly used anymore, uh, partly because the separations aren't so great. But in this case, you use a polar stationary phase instead of nonpolar, and a nonpolar organic um, mobile phase. Helic, which is picking up in popularity, is to separate polar molecules. And as it turns out, most of the molecules in the body are polar. And so this is a chromatography that's you know, desperately needed and, and probably is becoming increasingly more widely used. HPLC columns can be made up of different types of, of material. Uh, obviously, they have to be able to withstand high pressures. So there are, not too many, but there are glass columns. There are peak columns of plastic, and then most are stainless steel. Um, they are both preparative and analytical columns. So the preparative ones are big, thick uh, tubes, generally relatively short, and the analytical ones are somewhat narrower, longer tubes. Um, if you pull apart an HPLC column, I don't, has anyone ever pulled apart or packed an HPLC column? I guess everyone just buys them now. But if you pull them apart for fun, uh, when your boss isn't looking, uh, you'll find that they're filled with beads. And the beads are actually decorated with um, chains. And the chains are refer, when they talk about a C18 column, basically means an aliphatic chain of 18 carbons. A C4 column will be an aliphatic chain of C4. So this is the hydrophobic, almost lipid-like uh, surface that, that's put on these beads that are a few microns across. But you can also play around with other types of substrates. You can put on uh, biphenyl groups. You can put on sort of, I think, acetonitrile groups and other things that can change the, the polarity of the column. So the, the, the trick, really, is, is what you put on the surface of these beads. You can also improve the separation by changing the length of your column. So a longer column and longer column run improves your separation. You can get the same effect by working with smaller beads. And so this is the basis to UPLC. So the 5 micron beads are what you find in HPLC columns. The 1, 1 1.5 micron beads are what you find in the UPLC columns. But to push things through, the tiny, tiny beads means higher pressures. So the simplest HPLC setup, and it's also the same sort of thing you could do with uh, gravity feed columns. You'll have a solvent, that's your mobile phase. You pump it through for high pressure. You, you, you have a more complex solvent delivery system. Samples injected in front of the pump, between the pump and the column, and things are pushed out and you detect. And so you can detect with UV, you can detect with evaporative light scattering, you can detect with fluorescence, or you can detect with mass spec, or a combination of all of those. Um, so the detector is obviously key. It allows you to identify what's coming off. You can also do gradients. You can have A and B, and this is the most common configuration for HPLC. Uh, for lipids, people use three and sometimes even four solvents to get some incredibly complex um, ternary, quaternary gradients. And very, very skilled HPLC people can get amazing separations by playing around with the solvents. Um, so it's not much more difficult than just sort of the running the one, but defining your, your delivery and mixing process is often very challenging. So HPLC runs typically take between 20 and 40 minutes. UPLC runs can be shorter, uh, 10 minutes or less. And this is the type of separation you can get. Um, so in this case, we're seeing dozens of peaks. 
but what under each of those peaks uh, there may be several compounds or hundreds of compounds in some cases. Um, and what we're seeing is typically absorbance, so these are things that have UV um, absorptive moieties. Many other compounds are not, and so there's lots of other hidden or unknown peaks that, that you aren't seeing with this particular separation. So HPLC is great, but the best separation tool is gas chromatography. And unfortunately, not too many people appreciate it, uh, probably because it's an older technology. Uh, but in terms of plate count, which is how people measure separation, gas chromatography wins hands down. So this is the simple setup. It uses a much, much longer column. And instead of using a liquid uh, mobile phase, it uses a gas mobile phase. It also means having to make your um, sample volatile. It has to be turned into a gas. So not everything likes to be turned into a gas. Um, there is still uh, an inert uh, phase that, that is responsible for the separation. Usually it's a polymer that's attached to the column. As I say, the columns are really long, typically 10 meters or more, and the column widths are very tiny, millimeters. For some things, in order to fly in a GC column, you have to derivatize them with trimethylsilane. So this makes them very volatile. And there's other modifications you may have to do. Um, methoxymation, other things may also be used to make things volatile. Um, but this is this TMS addition that here we're taking, again, a, a sugar and, and an example of how it's being volatilized with the trimethylsilane. Derivatization um, is a pain, uh, and it's one of the reasons why GCMS isn't universally used. Um, in it's, it, it takes time, its efficiencies are debatable, and typically not everything is going to be modified equally. So for this compound, which is trimethylsilinated on one, two, three, four, you'll end up with probably four or five different variants of that, even though it's the same molecule. Um, because it um, will have two TMSs or three TMSs or uh, only one TMS but not the other. Anyways, all of those things will lead to different separation properties, um, which makes it complicated. On the other hand, there are a lot of compounds that we don't appreciate. Most of the things that m are responsible for the taste of food are volatile. So our tongue can only taste four or five things, you know, sweet, sour, bitter, but our noses effectively taste thousands of things. So the flavor of an apple is not what you taste on your tongue. It's, it's basically the aromas that are picked up through there. So the volatile components uh, of foods and beverages, same thing with wines and beers, again, it's the taste comes from what's in the volatiles. Those are things that are ideally characterized by GCMS. So here's this, typically the inert gas, usually helium, separation, some things that have higher affinity stick to the walls of the column, those migrate more slowly, those that come off more quickly uh, are less, have a lower avidity or affinity. And you can see the level of separation uh, which you get in GCMS, which is just amazing. It's, it's if all chromatography could be this way, then um, our lives would be very, very simple. Um, the Instead of, say, a C18 column, as we use in HPLC, there's typically a compound called polysiloxane that's attached or adhered to the interior of the column. So remember, this is very thin, very thin tube, and this polymer, which is a mix of both uh, aliphatic and, and aromatic compounds, uh, is what's responsible for the affinity of different um, volatiles or volatilized compounds. Now, the time it takes for something to move through either an HPLC column or a GC column is, is called the retention time. So it's how long it takes that analyte to pass through the column. So as I say, it's used, the term is used both for gas chromatography and liquid chromatography. It's affected by a lot of different things. It's affected by column dimensions, by the material that's inside the column, flow rates, 
temperature is a huge difference. Um, in the case of gas, it's the pressure as well as the carrier. In the case of HPLC and UPLC, it's also a pressure. So retention time calculations uh, for HPLC are basically hopeless because there's so many different columns. However, in the case of gas chromatography, it is possible to predict quite accurately and to calibrate using a thing called the retention index. And this is by using uh, retention time and normalizing to uh, a set of, of alkanes, a fairly standard set. So GC uh, is remarkably standardized and standardizable, as is GCMS, which we'll talk about a bit more, whereas LCMS is just about anything under the sun. Um, so this makes it really tough, and it's kind of unfortunate because in GCMS it was the only game in town for many years. The analytical chemists quickly moved in and said, this is how you must do it. The evolution of LCMS was largely, I think, driven by people in, in mass spec in proteomics who were trying to come up with every possible way of doing it. And so no one stepped in and said, this is how you have to standardize it. So from the metabolomics perspective, we need to go towards more standardized approaches. Um, this is essentially how you can do some compound identification and quantification when it comes to GC or LC as well. And this is measuring both the retention time and the area under the curve. So this might be attached to some kind of UV or flame ionization or, or a fluorescent or ELSD. We're not attaching to a mass spec, but this is still a valid way for doing identification and quantification by knowing the retention time and then by measuring or having other, another physical property that you can characterize. So the area under the curve, area under the peak, is, is still often the, one of the best routes for quantifying via either HPLC or GC. Again, this is just the picture, and if you compare or flip back and forth between the HPLC and the GC, you can see this remarkable difference in terms of precision and, and plate count and, and the narrow, narrow peaks. So those are quick perspectives on chromatography. Um, there's also how to detect things, and in this case, LC and GC are usually attached to mass specs. So in mass spectrometry, we're just trying to measure the weight of molecules to some extent, um, or the mass to charge ratio. Here's an older style um, QTOF instrument. Uh, we'll explain a little bit more, but the concept is that you can distinguish molecules by their molecular weight. And different molecules have different masses. Just like if we weighed everyone in this room, we could probably uniquely identify you by your weight. I doubt if there's anyone who's weighing exactly the same. And so this is the concept with, with mass spectrometry uh, for, for chemicals in particular. With mass spec, we can measure with incredible precision now, um, less than a ppm. Uh, and with that kind of precision, it's possible to determine the atomic or molecular formula. For large molecules, it's also become very, very powerful and means even for 40 and 50 kilodalton proteins, we can measure the atomic or molecular weight to, to one Dalton. So with mass spectrometry, we couple it either to a GC instrument or an LCM instrument or to another mass spec. So you're gonna have GCMS, LCMS, or MSMS. So you can do separations by a mass spectrometer and then also fragmentation followed by a more characterization by mass spec. And then you can have LCMSMS. MS. You can even have GCLCMSMS. MS. But anyways, it gets a little crazy. Um, with mass spectrometry, we have peaks, typically, with defined mass to charge ratios. And with the better instruments these days, you can get um, easily uh, identifying the individual um, isotopic components, uh, the C13 or deuterated or chlorinated compounds. And so you will see a collection of, of 
typically sharp, narrow peaks. If you have a lower resolution instrument, you will see sort of a single peak, which represents an average of all of those masses. In this case, is the average mass, which in this case for this compound would be 1156.3. It would be a big mound. So what we typically see in higher resolution mass specs, QTOFs, uh, Orbitraps, FTMS, we, is this collection of, of these isotopic peaks. And this has to do, as I said, with the abundance of certain isotopes, deuterium, carbon, in this case, chlorobenzene, chlorine, which has very high abundance of uh, chlorine 37, almost 32 percent. And so if you think about the formula and combining deuterated and C13 and chlorine compounds, you can see that there's different combinations, which will include different abundance of C13 or deuterium, to produce this array of molecular weights from 112 to 113 to 114, 115, and so on. So calculating, either in your head or with an isotopic calculator, you can come up with um, how many different conformations with uh, different combinations of isotopes, and you can estimate the intensity of those peaks as well as their positions. That information is incredibly valuable for determining a molecular formula. Um, and so this is what the chlorobenzene spectrum would look like in a higher resolution mass spec, and you can see that there's, it's not just this steady drop in peak intensities as you would have with something without chlorine. You see this second peak showing up that's two Daltons away, that's it's more intense. So isotopic distributions are important uh, for molecular formula determination, but they're also important to understand as these sort of extra peaks that seem to always show up beside your uh, primary peak. So in mass spec, um, the general principles are the same for just about all mass spec instruments. There's an ionization step. There's a mass analyzer, which actually performs separation through uh, either magnets or, or quadrupoles or traps. And then there's a, a detector, which allows you to, to see your signal. So a mass spectrum looks like a gas chromatogram, actually. Um, very sharp peaks, uh, and instead of having time on the axis, you have m over z. But there's an intensity, which relates to the detector and the abundance of the, those ions. Um, and um, um, this is, uh, uh, I think this is an EIMS of, of, of aspirin. So, like gas chromatography, very sharp, narrow peaks. The mass to charge ratio is on the x-axis. The intensity is basically the abundance of the ion. But unlike in gas or liquid chromatography where the intensity of the peak is basically related to the abundance, it's not directly quantifiable in mass spectrometry. You can't look at your peak and simply say, based on the area under this peak, this is my concentration. You have to have another known reference that you spiked in usually an isotopic reference or a calibration curve to actually get a quantitation. So mass spectrometry on its own without these isotopic pairs or uh, spike-ins cannot be quantifiable, whereas with chromatography you can quantify. And this has to do with the fact that ions have a different ability to fly, which is still not theoretically understood. So different mass spectrometers have different resolution and resolving power. And that's measured by the, 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 the mass that you're measuring and the mass difference between two masses that you can potentially separate. So this is the equivalent of resolving power in a microscope. So how many nanometers or microns can you go down to distinguish? So you can see on the, the right there, those two peaks at the top are easily resolved. You can see that there are two peaks. If we summed the areas down in that second one, it might be hard for some of you to distinguish between those. So we're just at the point where we can resolve those two peaks. So this is sort of the theoretical one, and it's the same thing that's used in NMR spectroscopy everywhere. It's just, what is your ability to resolve between two peaks? So the narrower the peaks are, 
the better your resolution. So here's a low resolution linear ion trap instrument mass spec. It has a resolution of about one Dalton and you can see just barely that there's sort of these other peaks in there but they're too broad, they all merge and you can't see the isotopic distribution. Run the same thing on a high resolution time of flight instrument and you can see all the peaks. So this is a case where the peaks are narrower. It's still the same window in terms of mass um, variation, but the narrower peaks are now resolvable. So this is an illustration looking at, if you want, the old technology of 15 or 20 years ago to the latest, probably in terms of Orbitrap, looking at the re resolving power, where in this case we're looking at a molecule that had a an monoisotopic weight of 3400, so it's a, it's a peptide, but with a resolving power of 1,000, that's a big, broad, blue peak, versus a resolving power of 30,000, which are those narrow, easily seen black lines. So there's a huge difference, and, and obviously, the better the resolution, the more likely you can actually characterize the molecule uh, in terms of determining its, its uh, molecular formula. So this is a schematic of a mass spec. Um, there's an inlet, there is a, uh, which is typically your HPLC or, or GC. Then there's an ion source, which is the thing that converts the molecules into ions. Then there's the analyzer, which essentially is responsible for separating the ions um, um, with their mass to charge ratio. And then there's the detector. To keep all of this working, you need lots of vacuum pumps. And these are the things that cause no end of, of pain to mass spectroscopists. Along with actually the ion source, if it's not regularly cleaned. So the, the ionization approaches differ. So mass spectrometry requires ions. You have to convert something to either a positively charged ion or a negatively charged ion. So the electron ionization is probably the original ionization method, and it's called EI, and it's also designated as the hard ionization method because it, it fragments things into tiny, tiny components. It's a very useful technique because of the fragmentation actually allows you to determine the structure of molecules. And there are still a few people around who can look at a GCMS spectrum and actually figure out the structure of a molecule. Now there's a chemical ionization which showed up a little later um, it's again designed for small molecules and it's not going to break things up into tiny fragments but it's it's a gentler approach it's useful for certain kinds of um, molecules um, and has, has emerged as actually increasingly being used then there's ESI and MALDI so these are the ones that have been developed um, for proteomics primarily and a couple of Nobel Prizes have been awarded to people that developed the concepts. They're very, very soft ionization methods. So they're just able to get molecules, sort of, you know, a single or a few charges, but you're not fragmenting the molecule very much, if at all. So the soft ionizations were great for peptides and proteins. They're normally now used for small molecules to get the parent ion mass but we typically want to then fragment the small molecules again uh, to get some structural information using a um, triple quad or um, other collision cell. So EIMS, because it was developed by analytical chemists, became very, very standardized almost immediately. Small molecules are let in, electrons are emitted from a filament, typically tungsten or rhenium, and they're sent off at a defined voltage, 70 electron volts, never varies, or never supposed to vary. Um, and then the ions that are generated uh, are fed into the mass spec, or the analyzer if you want. Um, you need the high energies, 70 electron volts, to break up the bonds in your chemical. 
because the chemical bonds are only held together with a strength of about five or six electron volts. So this bombardment, this impact with electrons, is the thing that's designed to shatter uh, small molecules. Those fragments are then things that are, are, are analyzed. So EIMS is standard with GCMS. So standardization again is retention indices for GCMS, standard voltage for, for EIMS makes for actually a really useful and easy way for characterizing small molecules. So this is an example of what happens with the EI impact with a simple molecule like methanol. First you'll ionize it so it can fly, so it gets a positive charge, but then you can knock off um, other hydrogens um, and produce uh, various ions. You can fragment and remove the hydroxyl groups, so you've just got a positively charged methyl group, uh, and then you can create other variations. So an EIMS spectrum of something as simple as methanol would produce uh, a mass spectrum which would have four or five different peaks. And the positions of those peaks are uniquely characteristic of this molecule and represent its fingerprint or its signature. Um, so if you're familiar with NMR, this is almost like an NMR spectrum. It's sufficient to determine um, the structure of this molecule. Now the soft ionization methods, ESI and MALDI, are, are different. MALDI uses a laser to um, excite or cause little explosions and send off ions. ESI uses a high voltage. Most metabolomics methods use ESI. Um, with imaging, people are starting to do that. But there's also efforts now to develop uh, small molecule MALDI systems uh, for things that are matrix free. I'll talk more about electrospray because as I said, it's the most common. In this case, things are fed in through a fluid, usually your HPLC. Um, and what you do is you have a, a, a sharp tip with a gas sheath around the, the fluid and a high voltage. And for reasons that are still not completely known, this causes an aerosol um, to, to form. So things start spraying out uh, in a tiny, tiny um, mist, basically, that is um, now charged. So if you could look at it in, in detail, this little capillary that's being fed into this vacuum change chamber is spitting out fluid. Um, the droplets are charged because of this high voltage, and as they pass into the vacuum, they start rapidly evaporating. And as they evaporate, the droplet becomes increasingly concentrated. The, the analyte concentration increases and increases but it's now filled with these charged molecules, and then they basically explode because of the charge repulsion that goes on. And so they explode and evaporate even further. So this is the concept uh, of how ESI largely works, but it, in the end you're, you're left with just, you hope, uh, single ions, um, some of which may have one or two or three charges, but just these ions that are uh, representing your analyte of interest. So you have to use polar um, buffers um, that are reasonably volatile. You can't work with salts because that messes ESI up. Uh, stainless steel is needed to, to prevent things from corroding. Strong voltages of three or 4,000 volts. And you aerosol things. And depending on the, the polarity of your solvent, you can produce um, different types of aerosol events at different voltages. So this just illustrates, you know, high water versus high acetonitrile, at which point you'll get this spraying phenomenon. You can have high volumes or low volumes. The nano spray techniques are now much preferred over the micro spray where you work with very low flow. It's very sensitive. Um, you can get away with tiny amounts, but you have to get rid of detergents. You have to get rid of salts. In ESI, you can work both in a positive mode and a negative mode, and that depends on the type of solvent or carrier you're, you're adding. So some people add a bit of formic acid to get a positive ion, a bit of ammonia to get negative ions. So the charging and the spraying or the ion source depends on the instrument. Um, we could go for 
several hours just talking about that. We don't have time. We're just sort of yes, giving you a quick overview. There's the mass analyzer. This is the thing that takes those ions that have been generated and separates them based on their mass to charge ratio. So there's time of flight, quadrupole, ion traps, orbi traps, magnetic sector, Fourier transform, ion cyclotron resonance instruments. There's a whole bunch. And so when you start mixing and matching the ion sources with the type of mass analyzers, you can end up with dozens of instruments. And this is, of course, great for manufacturers, but it's not great for standardization. Um, and, and this is a problem uh, for, for metabolomics. Um, but um, anyways, the original mass analyzer was a magnetic sector analyzer, big, giant magnets, um, very high resolution. They were very popular in the 70s, especially for doing environmental monitoring, because um, you needed to do that for um, things like the EPA. And, but you can get very high, high resolution, exact mass. Quadrupoles, single quads or triple quads, very low resolution. But as I mentioned earlier, these are ubiquitous in just about every clinical chemistry lab in the world. The time of flight is sort of the poor man's high resolution mass spec. They're getting to be very, very good actually. Um, they support very high throughput, um, very, very high resolution now. Um, the highest resolution mass spec is the ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometer. Um, they're not that popular. Um, they're very expensive and they're very low throughput instruments actually. I don't know, has anyone ever worked with an FTICR? Just one survivor. Um, now, you know, Victoria has one of the, the I think it's the biggest one in Canada. You get some um, amazingly high resolution uh, data with, with the FTMS and for certain applications that are the only instrument you can use. Um, so in terms of accuracy or in some respects resolution, um, this is what you typically see for these different instruments. So 0 0.1 to 1 ppm for an FTMS. The Orbitrap uh, below 1 ppm. Time of flight instruments are also approaching that now, so they can get uh, 1 to 2 ppm, the older ones are 3 to 5. Uh, the magnetic sector, which is almost no one has anymore, but it, it's almost matched what the Orbitrap could do. The triple quad, um, if you do some tricks, you can get higher resolution, but typically um, it's generally more on the order of 50 to 100 ppm, which is similar to the ion trap. So different instruments, different resolution, different precision or accuracy. So the output from a mass spec, usually coupled to LC, um, will be a collection which you'll have um, over time, either a total ion current chromatogram, a tick, a base peak chromatogram, BPC, or what's most commonly used is the extracted ion chromatogram, which is basically one of the analytes extracted from the base peak chromatogram or the total ion carrot. So the base bottom there is just illustrating the different things you will see or the types of data that are collected and or stored uh, from a mass spec LCMS type run. So one which is the red one, an unpleasant looking one, uh, the base peak chromatogram, which is generally more appealing and used to impress your friends. And then the extracted ion chromatogram, which is where you do most of your work. So if you're working with LCMS, you typically will have an LC chromatogram. And then associated with that, you'll be able to extract your ions and then identify, hopefully, these individual peaks with individual masses. So what's marked here is both the LC run, but also the mass, associated mass and therefore potentially the compound under those peaks. So again, quick overview of mass spec. Um, we're going to jump to NMR spectroscopy now. So how many people do LC or GCMS for their metabolomics? So about half. To, and how many people do NMR for their metabolomics? Zero. So maybe I'll just race through this one. But in fact, um, 
So, anyways, NMR um, was actually probably the original method for metabolomics. This is what launched the field. Uh, and it was a group in, in London, uh, Jeremy Nicholson, based at Imperial College, which approached or used NMR spectroscopy to look at mixtures. And NMR spectra look a lot like GC spectra, or high resolution, so very, very narrow peaks distributed over a chemical shift range. The concept with NMR is totally different from mass spec. You're not weighing molecules. What you are doing is you're putting a solution under a high magnetic field, and then you send radio waves into this magnetized fluid, and you measure the absorption. So you basically have a giant radio receiver, transceiver, transmitter, and you're measuring absorbance. And so just like with a color absorbance with UV, or um, you will see bands that are absorbed, uh, not necessarily on a color, um, but different bands at different chemical shifts. So nuclear magnetic resonance measures nuclear magnetism doesn't work with radioactive compounds, um, which is sometimes confusing things for people. It measures radio waves um, or light at radio frequencies, typically on the order of several hundred megahertz. So a little higher frequencies than your FM bands on radio. When you're measuring NMR, you're looking at changes in the nucleus and the nuclear spin. You can only have something that are something that's NMR active if it's under a strong magnetic field. And only certain types of nuclei will absorb at different energies, just like with UV. Only aromatic molecules absorb sort of in the UV range. Only certain types of nuclei can absorb uh, radio frequency energy. Fortunately, hydrogen is one of the strongest absorbers, and hydrogen is just about it in every single organic molecule, which has made NMR incredibly useful. So in the nucleus, you have protons and neutrons. Every atom, every molecule has protons, and these protons spin. And because they have a charge, anytime you have a charge that's spinning or rotating, you produce a magnetic field. So if something is spinning proverbially up, just like a clockwise versus counterclockwise spin, or spinning down, you'll have a um, sort of the right-hand rule with something pointing up, or counterclockwise a spin pointing down. When you've got protons spinning, they produce little miniature mag magnetic fields. So these little mini magnets, which are in every molecule under, uh, well, all the time, can be um, detected. So a sample, which has trillions of hydrogen molecules or atoms, um, can be uh, oriented. So when you have a very, very strong magnet uh, measured in tens of Tesla, uh, Tesla um, which is enough to pick up a city bus, basically, um, you have a material or a sample that's basically primed. So if you send in a radio frequency wave at the appropriate frequency, you will cause spins to flip, which is the equivalent of causing a magnet to flip. So we excite the sample with electromagnetic radiation of an appropriate frequency. It causes what used to be the blue spins to spin up or flip up and become red spins or red atoms. These are high energy forms. And then we turn off the radio frequency and things will relax. And so they will then sort of flip down or oscillate as they flip back down. We measure that oscillation over time. After that excitation or that pulse of radio frequency. And that allows us to measure the frequency of absorption of those particular um, atoms. In NMR, you need really big magnets, and the stronger the magnet, the higher the frequency uh, that you're able to measure, 
the greater the dispersion, the higher the resolution. So the biggest magnets in the world um, measure frequencies at, at about 1.2 gigahertz uh, or billion hertz. Most NMR instruments hover around five or 600 megahertz, and those are measured in terms of 10 to 15 tesla. So in NMR, you're not working with um, gases. Um, you're working with liquids. You pull the liquids up and you'll put them in, in some cases either into tubes or into flow cells. And the magnet, which is shown as that silver canister, which is about the size of a refrigerator, is connected to a radio frequency transmitter and receiver, which is also about the size of a refrigerator. And then the signals that are collected come out of a probe and are transferred to a, um, a computer. Magnets are about a million dollars. They can weigh several tons. They are superconducting magnets, um, and they are heavily insulated with uh, layers both of liquid helium on the inside and liquid nitrogen. They are not electromagnets. They're actually permanent magnets. They're charged once, and as long as you keep them cool, they will stay going forever, or almost forever. <coughs> um, the unique thing about NMR um, is that they're incredibly reliable. <coughs> so an NMR instrument never goes down if you take care of it. Whereas I think if anyone's worked with a GCMS or an LCMS, they go down every two weeks. Um, so this is a central advantage of NMR. Um, this is just, yes? So the liquid nitrogen is already inside that? It is, yeah. Yeah. The liquid nitrogen is actually used to cool off the liquid helium, which is in the interior. So you're trying to keep the magnet at, at about 4 degrees Kelvin, or minus 265 um, Celsius. So this is you know, very, very cold. Uh, and it's kept that cold by the liquid helium. So you can see the green layer in that cross-section, that's where the liquid helium is surrounding the magnet coils, which are a niobium tin alloy, which are wrapped around. And then you have layers of liquid nitrogen to help keep things even cooler or cold all the time. <coughs> you drop the sample in through the top. In the bottom, you have a probe, which is made up of um, this which has a little saddle coil. It's a, a, a little set of wires and a, a, essentially a, a tube which contains your sample, which is not much wider than a pen or a pencil, sits inside that saddle coil. And that's where all of the magnetic uh, and radio frequency um, activity happens. So remember, radio waves have both an electric and a magnetic component. And so it's that magnetic component of the radio waves that are responsible for pulsing um, the, the sample in the NMR tube. So there's an example of an NMR tube. As I say, it's about the size of a pencil. It sits in that saddle coil, and that's where all the magic happens. But it has to be surrounded by this very, very strong magnetic field. So an NMR spectrum, as I said, looks a lot like a GC MS type, or GC spectrum, or an MS spectrum. Narrow, narrow peaks. You're not separating by mass to charge, you're not separating by time, you're separating by chemical shift. So the chemical shifts are reported in frequencies or in parts per million. You'll have some interesting patterns, these are splitting patterns due to spin coupling, and then you'll have different intensities. So unlike in mass spec where the intensity is a matter of how well the ions fly, in NMR the intensity is directly proportional to the number of hydrogens. NMR allows you to quantify very precisely. So not only NMR is it very reliable, it's also quantifiable. It also does the separations automatically. You don't have to run anything through a chromatogram because things are separated on the basis of chemical shifts. So this is why NMR in fact was the first technology used for metabolomics. It did everything all at once. It quantified, it separated, it it, it allowed you to identify the compounds because you can look at both the chemical shifts and the splitting patterns to unambiguously identify the compounds. The chemical shifts are the reason why NMR works. Um, 
different hydrogen atoms and different molecules will absorb at different frequencies. So there's a unique pattern of chemical shifts, just like there's a unique pattern for EIMS for molecules. So these are fingerprints. And that chemical shift is defined by the electronegativity. And this is a standard chart. So again, there are people who can look at an NMR spectrum and actually figure out what the molecule is because they've memorized this little chart and they have a good understanding of chemistry. So this is an example of a really simple spectrum. So this is a bromoethane. But you can see how the influence of the bromine atom leads to pushing or shifting the A atom, so the A protons, further down, downfield, and then the B atoms less downfield. So this is the electronegativity of bromine, shifting things. And then you can see also the coupling patterns, where there's a quartet and a triplet uh, that's caused by the spin couplings, by the proximity to the CH3 or CH2 atoms. So again, someone who's skilled in NMR could just look at that spectrum, not knowing the molecule, and probably guess structure in the composition pretty accurately. So another example, and again, a fairly simple spectra, um, indicating this is the influence of aromatic rings. So you'll see chemical shifts around seven parts per million, and then uh, substituents. Now, NMR spectra are, when you initially collect them, quite ugly. Um, they have to be phased. They have to be referenced. They have to be, uh, samples have to be shimmed. There has to be some baseline correction to give things uh, some, some flattening. So you can see the top one, which is what you get immediately after uh, your pulses, and then the fixed spectrum, which generally looks a lot nicer and is far more useful. And it's the same sort of thing with the mass spec versus the total ion chromatogram versus the extracted ion. It's sort of the same extraction or fixing you do. And these are the, the, the steps that people will do to reference, to tetramethylsilane or DSS, which is a sulfonated derivative of TMS, shimming to make the lines look nice, phasing to make things look like they're all pointing up in the same direction. You normally collect in water from metabolomics, so you have to get rid of the water signal. And you try and get rid of the wobbly lines. So this is an NMR spectrum of a mixture. Um, so it looks a lot like something like a GCMS and an LCMS and an LC. They all have a great deal of similarity. But the thing that distinguishes them typically is, is the x-axis. Is it time? Is it m over z? Is it ppm? Now, why isn't everyone using NMR? Because there's lots of pluses for it. A lot of it has to do with sensitivity. So this graph just illustrates the differences between uh, sensitivity and, um, um, and the instruments here. The, um, um, mass spec, LCMS, you're able to detect in picomolar levels up to 10,000 features. NMR, it's typically down to 100 features or 100 compounds and typically micromolar sensitivity. GCMS is sort of in the middle. In the case of NMR, because it's so insensitive, you're usually measuring things that are known. So that's not terribly exciting to people. Uh, in the world of LCMS, you're measuring, or hopefully measuring, things that have never been seen before. The problem is that, as I say, we only identify about 200 compounds, even with LCMS which is roughly the same you measure by NMR. So currently, there's no difference. Uh, what we're hoping over time is that, you know, with LCMS, we'll measure thousands, but that's still not happening. Could, could I ask a question on that? So if you move to more and more sensitivity, um, it comes at the expense of throughput. Like you're going to, you know, there's a, there's a trade-off between, at least in proteomics, how many samples you can run versus, you know, the sensitivity sophistication of the instrument. So are you, is metabolomics trying to get more and more sensitive or? So I, I, people like sensitivity, but we're already more sensitive than what we can exactly. understand. Um, so, you know, right now NMR is 
that's a nice even st stable. So you can characterize and understand everything in NMR. Um, so from one perspective, that's probably all we should be working with um, until we can figure out what all these other compounds are that we can't identify. So is that is the limiting thing then libraries and metabolites? It is. Okay. Um, so this is just a quick comparison between the different types of techniques and given our time, because they're running out of time, <laughs> um, I'll just have people sort of, sort of look at that. But typically NMR, low sensitivity, so you need lots of volume. Mass spec, LCMS, you don't need very much at all. You can get away with 10 microliters. GCMS, again, sort of intermediate. There's the differences in throughput. Um, some, I think with, with automation, they can almost all be about the same in terms of throughput. Uh, but again, the limit of detection is quite different. So micromolar for NMR, nano, even um, picomolar for LCMS. Um, interestingly, there's not a lot of overlap. So what you measure when NMR is often not what you'll be able to measure in GCMS and is not what you'll be able to measure in LCMS. So if you're doing a comprehensive metabolomic study, you should use all three techniques. This just underlines sort of the typical results that people can get. So NMR actually holds a couple records for most compounds identified, even though it's the least sensitive technique. Um, GCMS, some people can get a lot of compounds identified, not very many quantified. Um, LCMS methods, it's, people are able to get up to several hundred now uh, in, in certain, certain situations. Lipid omics, um, people can identify many, many classes of metabolites, lipids, but not the unique lipids, typically. Um, but again, significant advances are happening. The other thing to remember, and this is sort of the last point, was to talk about the distinction between targeted and untargeted metabolomics. How many people do untargeted metabolomics? Six, seven, about half. How many people do targeted metabolomics? About a third. Um, so the concept between untargeted metabolomics, which is the original version or view of metabolomics, which is to just get lots and lots of samples uh, from cohorts or collections, um, treat the, the, the spectra, the resulting spectra, as you know, without assigning them, cluster the data. So convert the, the lists of peaks or, or bin the peaks, whatever you want to do, um, and, and perform some data reduction, which allows you to, to identify what features are, are significant. So things are at this stage still unassigned. Then, once you've identified which features are significant or important, then to go back and identify, or try your best to identify the metabolites. Targeted methods are, are different in the sense that they will um, right away either use specific standards or spend a great deal of time doing compound identification and quantification at the start. Then take all of the lists of known compounds, known concentrations, and do the data reduction, PCA, PLSDA. And then do the data interpretation after that. Now, there is a very strong trend now to actually go more and more towards targeted or quantitative metabolomics. And this is because, in large part, people have found that the untargeted approach is leading you to this sort of tantalizing set of, of compounds which you can't identify. Of course, you can't publish. And so you've done all this work, and you're left sort of you know, hanging high and dry. The targeted approach is actually allow you to work with identified metabolites, but if you're doing the targeting well, you're quantifying precisely. And so you can still report the same compounds that everyone's always seeing, but because you know the concentrations, you can actually distinguish the differences quite objectively and consistently. So that means you can publish. And it also allows you to come up with things like biomarkers, which then are reproducible and usable uh, in other, other labs. Question. Um, I guess you're, you're using targeted in terms of both when you have a platform of uh, metabolites you've already 
described and characterized, as well as the approach of first trying to identify them. In some literature I've been reading, it's that the target refers to a specific platform or a specific yeah. screening. Or yeah, and this is, I don't like the term targeted, <laughs> um, which is why I usually put in the word quantitative. Right. Um, because, yeah, some people will have sets, and it depends on the platform. So if you do mass spec, you have to have a sort of collection of, of a library that you put in. If you do NMR, you don't have a library of compounds. You, you, you just have a reference set of spectra that you look up. GCMS is also a little different, too. And then there's other techniques where you can do chemically selective, targeted. Um, but in the end, if you can quantify, and if you identify... And so if that bundle I'll call targeted, then you're way ahead of the game. Uh, but if you treat things simply as, here's a collection of features, I'm just going to process the features, and this is the chemometric approach, which was the original way of doing it, you still end up with a lot of data but not much to publish on. And um, it's, it's been very problematic. And it's, I think, one of the things that has held metabolomics back. So typically what you try to do in the end is you go from your spectra to lists. So whether it's the untargeted or targeted, you still want to come up with some lists of compounds. Now ideally the lists aren't just the compounds, you might have some relative or absolute quantitation. From the lists, you want to go to pathways. Pathways allow you to do some biological interpretation and relate to physiology or environment or genes and proteins. And this is this integration and connection. From pathways, you can also go to models. This is where the systems biology comes in, but also to biomarkers, which is where the clinical or veterinary or, or botanical or farming applications come in. So we're going to talk about those things in the next session, about going from spec to lists, and we're also going to be talking about going from lists to pathways and biomarkers. And that's really the subject for the next two days, really. So we're behind, um, but um, <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll um, have our break.